I, do, I don't want to be a private uh, pediatrician. I want it to be a social enterprise company so that people who can and can't afford can come. Uh, and of course, I'd like the, the Busy Bee logo because I think uh, it kind of captures something about uh, children we look after. Okay, so now to, to attachment. So all these are uh, words for attachment in dictionary and then the opposite is, is the, um, the you know, uh, loathing and uh, hostility and so on. Uh, but the attachment is, is perceived as bond and devotion and, and love. Of course, all of that, uh, we know it's on the continuum. You know, one day you're going to be loving your children and another day, you know, you really um, can't have uh, much patience for them and your feelings are quite different. So it is on continuum and it changes all the time and depends how you feel yourself, of course. Well, this psychiatrist called Bolby, John Bolby, he worked in, uh, in a place called Tavistock Clinic, which is in North London in the 30s. And he did a lot of observation with children in orphanages, including uh, in the UK, children evacuees in the war who were separated from their family. Um, and children uh, who were in his clinics, uh, he observed as having basically conduct disorder, so criminal activity and so on. And he, he did describe attachment as, as an innate process that uh, in a good rearing uh, environment is going to lead to a, a feeling of attachment security and ability to create good relationships as an adult. Um, some of the work he did, and this is what I want to show you uh, throughout the talk, is actually based on the research that may be um, not quite as objective uh, as, as uh, would be ideal, and, and that may well be influencing people, uh, you know, just picking out research that shows association it doesn't in fact mean that attachment problems are a cause of difficulties. And I think if you are not, uh, you know, if people are not able to um, decipher some of the research that has gone on, um, then you come to the situation where people are, are blamed uh, when the research was basically flawed. Uh, I, I hope that I will, I will demonstrate this to you. So, uh, if we, if we um, can um, sort of make our, uh, ourselves uh, feel uh, like a newborn baby, uh, this is Hermes, He's, uh, and that's him here. So, um, not that one, that's Achilles, uh, that's um, Apollo, his brother. Uh, so, this is Hermes, a little baby, and uh, he was obviously a god who could do things at the age of four days, uh, including stealing his uh, brother Apollo's cattle. And when he was um, going to uh, be punished by Apollo, this is what he said to him. So he didn't steal the cattle, though he did. And he said all he cares about is, is his mother's milk uh, sleep, having wraps around his shoulders and warm baths. And I think if you try and think yourself as, as a young baby, this might well be what a young baby uh, would like. So uh, the attachment process uh, is described here quite well, I think. However, Hermes grows up to be a bit of an uh, ADHD god, I think. That's him. Uh, with uh, uh, wings on his sandals, he's very hyperactive, he becomes god of thieves and travellers, but he's also very creative and invents music, and uh, he's also got uh, empathy because he, he can take um, souls to other world. And I think it's a bit like our children with ADHD, I could find some similarities there, because you know, ADHD existed in 
Greek civilization. It was just not. <laughs> it was just not described. And uh, because the Greeks gave human characteristics to their gods, I think this is the one with ADHD. Quite, quite like that story. So, what are the principles of attachment? First of all, is it's, it's a dynamic process, like I explained. So it's not just passive from a parent or, or you know, lots, you'll find a lot of researchers about mothers. But I'll say parent, it's not just passive. Baby is not passive to what you, uh, as you know, it's not, uh, it's not what you give, it's what the child gives as well. So, um, in theory, it's how attuned a parent is to child's need, uh, what factors affect quality of attachment. For example, depression might be, uh, postnatal depression might be a problem. And the important thing is that we have different attachment styles, but it doesn't mean that child is disordered as a result. Attachment disorder is very rare indeed, and it's probable that, you know, um, I would say less than 1% of children in my clinic would have attachment disorders. So what happens to the child, like I mentioned, it would affect child self-esteem, ability to form relationships, and um, how they can uh, form independence, uh, uh, independent uh, relationships in the future and live independently. So th these are styles of attachment. The way they were measured in psychologically, so in a, in a, a sort of a, a laboratory, if you like, a psychologist did this. So you'd have an 18-month-old child uh, who was with the mother playing, and uh, then uh, mother would leave, uh, leave the room, the stranger would come in, and then the mother would return to the room. And what they then looked at is what the child would do when the mother returns. So it's, a, it's again mother, but that, that is what they did. Uh, and on the basis of this observation, they, um, the psychologists, in repeated experiments, have, um, have described secure and insecure attachment style. So secure attachment style is when when the mother returns, the child comes to the mother as a cuddle, and then it's still he or she is happy to explore and uh, and be confident in that, confident and comp uh, competent. So the ch in theory, the child feels that the relationship is valuable um, and it's worth seeking uh, attention, and it can function well as uh, later on as he or she develops. And as an adult, you can use the information, both emotional information and what they, um, what facts they get uh, to form relationship. And they can predict rewards that they will get in life and they seek them appropriately. However, 45%, so this can't be a disorder, 45% of people have insecure, so-called, attachment styles. They can't have 45% of the population being, um, uh, being uh, uh, in some way, pathological. You know, uh, they have different styles. Some of it will be protected. So, um, I've already, so on the basis of this uh, strange, it's called strange situation test, there are three types of, of um, <clears throat> attachment. There is the anxious one, so this is where a child clings onto the mother when she comes back. And then there is the avoidant, where the child doesn't care about the mother when she comes back. And then there is what they call disorganized, which is where a child is confused. One moment it clings, the other time it is, uh, is uh, avoiding the mother. And it is the disorganized attachment that people are worried about most. Um, so I think I'm going to rush through some of these, but essentially to say that an anxious attachment, uh, on one hand, will have a situation where it might be implicated in um, 
children who are a bit more anxious and as adults there are a little bit more anxious as well. But we know that personality uh, of the children, they can be born with anxiety. So again, this is something that psychologists have, uh, have uh, assumed is to do with attachment. But people are born with anxious personality. Uh, avoidant, uh, and as adults, they are a bit preoccupied with their feelings and so on. Avoidant attachment, this is a positive side to it, is that uh, people might uh, uh, have more independent um, and self-reliant personality as adults. As, par as parents, perhaps it is described that they're perhaps not as attuned. Um, and as adults, they're more likely to be um, uh, dismissive of their own feelings and with less form. Uh, While well, disorganized attachment, which is the most common form of insecure attachment, is thought to be bad news. So um, this is where we do see this as pediatricians in situations where there is neglect, for example. I'm not saying it's an ADHD, but I have, you know, as a pediatrician, dealt a lot with children who uh, have been uh, sadly abused and neglected. This is the disorder, okay, reactive attachment disorder, that is severe form. So uh, often it would happen in very abusive and neglectful families or in orphanages, children growing up, uh, you know, growing up having been, for example, Romanian orphans. Um, so you'd have the inhibited type, which is hypervigilance. Children are just frozen watching and waiting, you know, where the next blow is coming from. Or you could have what's called this inhibited type. These children would go to anybody. But then again, you know, this doesn't mean, I'm sure there are, I come across lots of children with ADHD who have very little inhibition, and they would uh, be very, um, um, you know, parents would often say to me, you know, they, they just approach anybody. But, um, doesn't mean that they have reactive attachment disorder. It's something about biology of ADHD that stops them stopping and thinking, uh, and, and they just tend to, you know, be a little bit disinhibited because their frontal lobe is not as well developed as, as they would be in other children. But this is a, a, a follow-up of children with, uh, from Romanian orphanages. So here you've got in attention and hyperactivity. This is, these are children, uh, green ones, that are adopted in the UK. So assuming that they haven't been to orphanages, we don't have orphanages anymore. Um, and these are children from Romanian orphanages who were adopted less than six months of age. And these are the ones that were older than six months. And the ages are six to adult. And you can see how much um, more common ADHD is in these children. So you have to be pretty extreme to, to have that amount of neglect to have ADHD as a consequence. And there, there are quite a lot of things that we're looking at, but that's, that's, an aut uh, that's autism diagnosis here as well. So you can see that everybody, lots of children, I mean 5% is around here, which is normal for uh, ADHD population, uh, uh, so it's 5% um, within population. It's a bit more if you are adopted. Um, I have noticed that actually children from adopt, who are adopted uh, in this country will have higher uh, prevalence of ADHD. That's probably something to do with why they were adopted. Um, it may well be that, that, that you know, there were problems with um, drug abuse and pregnancy. Are you, um, are you saying that ADHD and attachment disorder have the same symptoms? Uh, well, uh, what it is, is that it is assumed that these children who were adopted 
after six years of age um, have got uh, attachment disorder. And attachment disorder and the insult that happens with lack of environmental stimulation to that degree and lack of primary carer uh, to that degree it then produces uh, symptoms of ADHD. So it, it has to be extreme. The point is, it still responds to medication. So there is an environmental component to ADHD, but it is a much bigger genetic component. So if you have twins, identical twins, you are going to have ADHD in, in a second twin in 70% of the cases. So it's much bigger genetic component. But if you, uh, if you are subject to extreme environmental deprivation, such as a mania orphans, you are also going to have higher risk of ADHD. So here, the risk goes up from 5% to about 20%. 4%, four times higher. But really, that was extreme. You know, that you don't have that kind of. Less people are in extremely neglectful and abusing, which, as I said, I, I haven't seen very much of the 2,000 patients that we have in the clinic. The, the, the attachment styles are something completely different, and. Um, I think that's what the confusion is. The, um, the research was interpreted in a way that um, it made it look like you know, the environment around the child was a problem. Well, we know it's always going to be environment and genes, but there is a large genetic component. We do, and uh, and I'm just uh, going to. So this is this again shows um, a little bit about. I'll just show you that slide. So these are children who are raised um, in a sort of pathological care in this country. Again, confirming that they have ADHD. So this is something uh, about how we assess it. So it is all about history. We're going to be talking to uh, parents. So very important, what was their own attachment to their own parents? That's really one of the things that matter. How close they feel uh, to the child. One of the things that I always ask first is actually ask, I ask the child first of all, what, what are you good at? That tells me something about self-esteem there. And then I ask the parent, what do you think he or she is good at? And if I hear, you know, he's not good at anything, I can't stand him, I hate him. <laughs> so I do get worried about that particular situation and I'm wondering a bit about attachment. I know there are days when we all feel like that, but... Um, together with other um, uh, clues that I might have, I do, I do worry about that. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think, again, I think there are lots of factors why a parent feels it like that, but um, it could well be that, you know, a child is adopted, for example, it's not a, it's not a um, biological child, and that may be a, a for attachment issues. And I want to show you this, it's a bit of a complicated thing, but just to summarize it. So these are, these are mothers who gave donated um, eggs for IVF, so, and they had ADHD. Their children had ADHD, genetically more likely to have ADHD. This is then a new family, a, a, a non-biological mother and a, a father, presumably biological father. The biological father was asked to report symptoms uh, in the child and the mother. And what's happened is that as, as things went on, child's impulsive and difficult behavior 
has influenced, have influenced the mother to become a bit more hostile towards that child. The father has observed that. Then the mother herself began to, this is non-biological mother, began to, do, to display ADHD symptoms herself. And then that, uh, that caused more hostility um, and that caused more problems with the poor child. So it's almost like it can be infectious um, and you know, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. So these relationships are extremely complex. There is genetics, there is environment. So in terms of pediatrics and child psychiatry, which would include mental health workers, it's about half and half who sees children with ADHD. I believe that both pediatricians and psychiatrists and mental health workers and ADHD nurses should know a lot about attachment. The difference would be in the interpretation. So it depends in what school of thought you come from. So for example, if you are what we call psychodynamically trained, you're going to, uh, you're going to put a lot of emphasis on various theories of attachment, uh, not just Bowlby, uh, but um, people before him, you know, including Freud and, and Melanie Klein and so on. Um, and later on, uh, you might have revision of that theory, for example, uh, when it comes to you know blaming of the mothers, there has been a revision of that, uh, looking at research and, and saying you know that it doesn't have to be with a child, uh, you know 100% of the time and, and uh, provide this warm, amazing parenting. Uh, children can survive anyway, uh, and there are <coughs> resilient there are resilience factors. I often call that you know, the Dandelion and, and the Orchid type of child. You can have a child that you just throw anywhere and it will thrive, and you need somebody who needs extreme nurturing in order to, to, uh, to thrive. And I think that is where uh, ADHD probably falls, you know, more of an Orchid rather than a Dandelion type of child. But I think the difference is in emphasis, and I would like to think that people within pediatrics are a, a little bit more optimistic, uh, and that if you have psychodynamic training, you're going to be much more, uh, uh, much more um, likely to make a diagnosis of attachment disorder or uh, attachment difficulties. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily a good thing. You know, one could argue that pediatrician perhaps don't know enough about it. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think we do see an awful lot of children with various problems. Pediatrics is becoming a mental health problem at the moment. For example, uh, I go around children's wards uh, where lots of girls are admitted with self-harm and overdose. Now, I'm teaching all my junior staff to assess for ADHD because I know mm. that the outcome of untreated ADHD in girls and women can be really, really difficult. You know, depression, self-harm is very common. So um, we are aware of that and, and we do want to um, pick it up because I think early diagnosis is uh, essential. They don't all need to be on treatment with medication, but I think the big, if, if there are problems with attachment, and this is what I find in my work, you know, some parents are worried about giving labels to the children, which is fair enough, and I, I don't want to be there, you know, giving labels for the sake of saying, you know, all is fine, the child just has ADHD and that's it, or, or giving medication where it's not warranted. Uh, but I think giving the diagnosis may well uh, be a beginning of some kind of healing process between the parent and the child because, um, you know, people do then get to understanding why the things as they were. Could I just briefly ask you to elaborate on body signals 
eating pattern and toilet. Yeah, so this is when things can go extreme, for example. Mm. So I do get worried if the child is uh, smearing feces on the walls. Right. Which I do see. So that's a very disturbed behavior in, in some way. Um, and there are other different levels. So there are ways that children can talk with their bodies. Um, it's still possible, you know, that there are issues going on at school which are going to make children uh, disturbed, maybe bullying and so on. But that, that's a body issue. Would a child who refuses to wipe their bum come under that or not? Um, I think it, that's more about uh, wanting to be oppositional, possibly. Right. So I think. I had quite a lot of slides about that, but I might as well just talk. I don't know where I am with slides, so I'm just <laughs> going to be talking about that. So, what seemed to be happening, you know the disorganized attachment style I was talking about. Um, well, it's ADHD is going to, the, the child is so poorly <coughs> controlled himself or herself, that adults around the child are going to need to or feel that they need to uh, give structure, like you said, and control the behavior. And of course, um, if anybody tells us that, uh, you know, uh, uh, something about our behavior all the time to do things this way or another, we're going to want to rebel against that. Mm -hmm. And although the child needs that kind of approach um, to be able to function, to them, it still feels like too much control. So that's a challenge. <coughs> How much control can we give um, without making things too difficult? Does overeating come into eating pattern? There is, uh, well, obesity and overeating is certainly uh, uh, one of the issues that we see in, in ADHD, and so is anorexia. So eating disorders are more. But there is then another um, extreme pattern where the child might be stealing food and behaving in a way that would make me think that you know there is emotional issue there because um, they're perhaps not getting as much loving attention as, as they uh, should have. I, I do remember one family. Uh, where that was the case. So sometimes there are situations in, in families and environments that uh, make make, this, uh, make it happen that the child perhaps feels uh, maybe lack of attention or neglected and so on. And one of the emotional responses for the child would be um, uh, would be uh, seeking food, mm. and they wouldn't. They wouldn't necessarily get a piece in that situation. That's that's a different thing altogether. You can have obesity in order to comfort eat, but you can also have overeating and, and stealing food as uh, as a need for emotional um, warmth. Children with ADHD are difficult to assess for attachment in a formal way, uh, but this is. Um, this is how people have done it in the literature, in research. Okay, so they have taken a group of children and followed them up uh, and found that some who have oppositional behavior and ADHD are more likely to have disorganized attachment. The point is, Assessing attachment in children with ADHD is extremely difficult. So the researchers themselves may be using completely the wrong tools to assess the attachment. Maybe something to do with ADHD itself, rather than the child's attachment difficulties that is resulting in this kind of statement. Uh, and I think that this is another battle to have. You know, researchers do all of this, but are they using the right ways to actually check for it? Because if you, the way they've done it is they uh, they give the child a story, and they're meant to complete the story. But we know that um, 
when you know somebody has done the research looking at how good are they in completing their stories they're actually not that good because of their ADHD not because they have uh, attachment problems so the, the problem is much more complex and it is to do with um, ADHD itself and the way the research has been done and, and so people who blame attachment as a cause for ADHD need to know how to interpret this research and understand that there are many other confounding factors that may uh, make it look like it's attachment problem but actually it might just be as simple as, as finding it, uh, you know, not having a good method of assessing it. Mothers themselves can have difficulties with attachment to their own parents, and that is going to affect how they relate to their children. Same goes for fathers. The fathers can get away with not knowing anything, uh, not being involved. And this is the, the chemical uh, called oxytocin. Okay, so this may be a little bit of science fiction, although it has been uh, already researched. So oxytocin is what women uh, uh, produce when they are pregnant, when they are having, uh, when they're in labor and when they're breastfeeding. But everybody produces oxytocin. All mammals have it and it's important for many other things. Including, you know, when you touch your dog and stroke your dog, your oxytocin level goes up. So, uh, oxytocin is a chemical of attachment. Okay, and maybe one day we'll be able to use it, just the same way as we are using medication for ADHD. Maybe we'll be able to use oxytocin in treating attachment problems. Uh, and the good thing about oxytocin, you can give it uh, as as a uh, at the moment, just as an experimental nose spray. We have lots of research saying that oxytocin is important in attachment. Father's brain is sensitive to uh, child's care experience because their oxytocin level goes up as well. You don't have to be pregnant to have babies. If you have interaction with a child, oxytocin level is going to go up. And then the second one is fascinating because these are Two fathers, uh, they're gay uh, men adopting a baby, but there's no mother in sight. And that research shows that, um, that it is also uh, possible for men to, having a closeness with the baby, have as much uh, oxytocin uh, available in the brain, and the brain looks like mother's brain basically so you just need that closeness with the child to to be able to be in position to automatically develop attachment um, if you have a gene that is a problem gene or a risk gene in your uh, oxytocin system then you're going to have biological reasons why you have difficulties <coughs> with attachment. So it's not just genes of ADHD, it's not just about environment. It's about your genes and your propensity to be attached. So here we are, low maternal care. These women here, they don't have a problem gene and they don't have to give, give very much uh, uh, care, sort of attachment, um, uh, sort of promoting care to their babies, they will ha the babies will have good oxytocin level in the blood. While those mothers who have problem gene, they will have, you know, babies will have oxytocin, uh, uh, will be low in the blood. If you have high maternal care, so a good maternal care, but even with a gene that's a problem, you can improve the oxytocin level in the baby's blood. In other words, it is also about biology of attachment. So it's not just about environment, it's not just about your mother 
uh, or your father not bonding to you. It's not just about you know, ADHD being genetic and biological condition. It's about are you also, as a parent, born with problem genes which is making you more difficult to attach for biological reasons? And again, this is um, fascinating, I think, uh, because potentially it could lead to different treatments within the parent training kind of arena that it's so difficult to do. So um, it's already been done, but, but my um, sort of vision, and it's not just me, is that you know here we have anxiety and stress about uh, having ADHD uh, in our family. We have got we have to somehow uh, support the parents to improve the, the um, relationship with the child. Mm -hmm. And therefore we do behavior therapy or parent training. And maybe one day we can also do this, to so give the oxytocin, and then we can have both biological and behavioral therapy. Um, and just to say that oxytocin in children with ADHD is low. So they have problem too. Um, so, in conclusion, therefore, I think milder attachment problems are unlikely to lead uh, to ADHD. Uh, there could be the case in that extreme deprivation that we see in Romanian orphanages. Parent training um, is recommended. Could oxytocin help? I believe many parents see uh, do excellent job in uh, raising their child with ADHD. We as professionals should, should um, show compassionate solidarity with that, rather than blame the parents. But to summarize here about the attachment, it's not simple. It uh, relates to uh, parental health, parental ADHD, parental attachment, uh, their own mental health, it's association, doesn't mean it's a cause, it's there together, but doesn't mean that one's caused another. And a measure of attachment in children is a problem. Um, so very, very uh, much a, a, a sort of intensive um, work to be done with people who have real problems with, attach, with attachment. But I believe diagnosis and treatment is the most important. ADHD behavior, it's not possible for a child to um, control. So you'd have to ignore some of the, I believe one has to ignore some of the ADHD behavior because that is within the child's nature. Uh, and maybe, obviously, I'm not going to ignore the aggression and, and uh, destroying things. But then use every opportunity, and up to the age of about eight to ten, it's quite possible to do um, non-directive play. So I would say for the child to lead a parent in play rather than the other way around. And that would somehow take away this issue where this is the child is getting a lot of control. So lots of um, ways of not directing the child in times where you know there isn't destruction of things or aggression uh, or extreme disobedience, um, so um, noticing things that are good, giving some pro problem-solving situations so the child feels in control, giving choices, and uh, doing uh, you know everything possible that you both enjoy. Sometimes getting out of the house is probably the best way. Uh, something that you both enjoy um, to you know, bond over, if you like. I think for dads in particular, sport is really uh, bonding. I mean, maybe my prejudice, but uh, for dads, I know that uh, lots of dads spend a lot of time doing sports with children, which is 
explained. And, and to um, remember that these people are now coming out saying, you know, they have been diagnosed with ADHD. These are uh, musicians, artists, sportsmen, and women, uh, actors. So remember all the time, like I said about Hermes, you know, these people, you know that they are creative uh, people and start nurturing that and giving child self-esteem to everything um, that you possibly can. And it may not be possible through school. Obviously, you want to work on school as much as you can. But um, anything else that you can that you can do to boost the self-esteem is going to um, make child more likely to accept um, praise. But there are children who can't accept praise because their self-esteem is so poor it actually feels uncomfortable to accept praise. Well, the actual problem is a neurodevelopmental disorder that has then become associated with great opposition of behavior and so on. Some children uh, didn't speak about um, other types of, uh, of problems associated with ADHD. There is something called callous unemotional trait. Again, those children are very... Um, difficult because they don't show any remorse. They do they do certain things and they don't show any remorse. Um, aggressive things. But you know, even they have been found to have genetic issues related to that. Um,